where the couple entered into polygamy at the urging of first wife, Phoebe. On the 2nd of March, 1909, David took as his second wife, Lenora Timpson, and just nine months later, gave birth to Rulin Timpson Jeffs, as I mentioned, born in December 1909. Two younger siblings followed, Lenora, born in 1912, and Arlene, in April 1917. Throughout this period, the family led a nomadic existence, living in a number of different communities. They moved from Salt Lake to Logan, then back to Salt Lake, a return to Logan, and thence to Midvale, a small mining town south of Salt Lake City. And I might mention that was where my boyhood home is, so I don't know the community. Then, but they didn't stay there very long because they moved to the Butlerville bench, and then Provo, then ultimately back to Salt Lake City. All of this, these moves took place during one decade of the 19-teens. Prompting the family's numerous moves were two basic factors. The first was David's struggle to find adequate employment to support his polygamous households. Secondly, David sought to evade both civil and church authorities seeking to eradicate the active practice of plural marriage, this intensifying in the wake of the Second Manifesto of 1905. This necessitated living on what became known as the underground. Thus, David took the name Jennings to keep secret his plural marriage. As Rulin himself later recalled, my last name was Jennings up until the time I was 11 years old when the family re reclaimed the name Jeffs. Despite growing up in a polygamous family, the younger Jeffs knew nothing about Mormonism. As he later confessed, I hadn't even heard of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints until I was about 10. Meanwhile, Ruin's father, David, interacted with a who's who of fundamentalist Mormons, specifically John W. Taylor, John W. Woolley, Joseph White Musser, Israel, and John W. John Y. Farlow. All such ties to fundamentalist Mormonism notwithstanding, David Jeffs, for reasons that are not clear, started going to the 34th Ward on the south side of Salt Lake City and started working in the church. Rulin himself was subsequently baptized at the age of 11. Rulin embraced mainstream Mormonism with vigor and enthusiasm. He attended LDS High School in Salt Lake City, where he distinguished himself as an outstanding student. He served as student body secretary and received what was known as the Heber J. Grant Award, a scholarship which paid his expenses. Rulin graduated, graduated as class valedictorian, affording him the opportunity to address fellow classmates at the graduation ceremony held in the LDS Tabernacle on Temple Square. Following graduation, he secured employment at the LDS Business College. At the same time, he took business college courses in accounting, which prepared himself for his future highly successful career as a certified public accountant. On that same campus, he met and courted Zola Brown, the daughter of none other than Hugh B. Brown, a prominent Latter-day Saint and later Mormon apostle. In early 1930, Rulin Jeffs was called to serve a two-year LDS mission in Great Britain, departing that June. By this time, Rulin and Zola had developed a strong relationship and thus stayed in contact through correspondence during the course of his mission. Meanwhile, Rulin's parents both continued to be very active in the LDS church work, Herc in the Relief Society, and he doing block teaching and serving as a gospel doctrine teacher. Rulin's British missionary experiences proved initially challenging, but ultimately rewarding. The initial portion of his mission was spent in Dunn's Table, and Luton, where he distinguished himself as an effective missionary. 
Thus, in November 1930, he was transferred to mission headquarters in Birmingham, where he served as assistant secretary to the president of the British mission, an individual by the name of A. William Lund. He developed a, a, a very close relationship, as I say, and he described Lund as both wonderful and inspiring. It's worth noting that Lund himself would go on to serve as assistant church historian under Joseph Fielding Smith, and as a personal aside, I, when I started doing research, I was interviewed by A. William Lund before he let me into the church archives. That was an interesting experience, but it's beyond the scope of this paper. Uh, <laughs> uh, as Jeffs continued his mission responsibilities, A. William Lund was succeeded by James H. Douglas as mission president. At the conclusion of his mission, Je Jeffs wrote a mission status report under the, president, uh, under the direction of President Douglas and was instructed to deliver it in person to President Heber J. Grant upon his return to Salt Lake in August 1932. The meeting, however, proved less than not ideal. As, he, as, as Jeffs himself later recalled, upon entering Grant's office, I proceeded to shake hands with him, which I swear was like shaking with a cold fish. After giving his report, Grant's curt reply was, well, Brother Douglas could have written that. With Jess later lamenting, I left his office very crestfallen, and indeed I felt squelched. Jess faced a series of other new challenges. Among these was securing gainful employment a daunting task given the state of the economy, then in the depths of the Great Depression. After considerable effort, he obtained a position with the Salt Lake Milk Producers Association. It was an office job, accounting, bookkeeping, which was in line with his background and training. Also challenging Rulin was his relationship with Zola Brown. Rulin was anxious to marry immediately, proposed to Zola who demurred, saying she was not ready. This was due a part in the fact that she had commenced dating another man, uh, an individual by the name of Waldo Hudson. Hudson. Zola's reluctance to marry Rulin also stemmed from a second factor, at least in part, her concern over the open secret of David's, Jeff's polygamous marriages. Such concerns notwithstanding, ultimately Zola agreed to marry Rulin, thereby terminating her relationship with Walter Hudson. The young couple were married on the 1st of June, 1934, in the Salt Lake Temple, with none other than church president at that time, Heber J. Grant, performing the ceremony. Over the following five years, the couple had two sons, Richard born in 1936, and Daniel, who came along in 1939. Reflective of the family's improving economic status, Rulin secured employment with the Utah State Tax Commission. His ties to influential church uh, leaders and, and all of that aided in this very prestigious job during the depths of the Great Depression. All, success, all such success notwithstanding, however, by the early 1940s, Rulin faced an even greater challenge, his decision to embrace fundamentalist Mormonism. Influencing Rulin greatly in this decision was his father, David, who introduced him to the fundamentalist writings of Joseph White Musser, as contained in Truth Magazine. After studying these fundamentalist teachings and writings, Rulin became convinced of their correctness and that authority, ultimate church authority, to practice polygamy rested with uh, this group. He then received both a patriarchal blessing and ordination as a 70 in the fundamentalist organization, which was guided by that time by, by a, a group of seven men known as the Priesthood Council. Uh, Rulin also began attending fundamentalist cottage meetings he engaged in all this activity without the knowledge of Zola. However, in May 1939, 
Ruland finally informed Zola of his conversion to fundamental Mormonism and tried, without success, to get her to join him. And, and, and this created a real crisis, obviously. They separated, the couple separated shortly thereafter, and ultimately divorced. Zola gained custody of the couple's young, two young sons and ultimately remarried to none other than Walter Hudson, who she had dated previously. <laughs> and, 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 and to make matters worse, one of the, uh, uh, the oldest son adopted the surname of his stepfather. Bruin was excommunicated from the LDS Church on the 14th of April, 1941. From then on, Ruin threw himself completely into the work, as it was called, promoting fundamentalist Mormonism. In November 1942, the group's priesthood council, led by John Y. Bartle, appointed Jeffs to head the board of trustees for the United Effort Plan, established to oversee the economic welfare of Short Creek. In line with his fundamentalist Mormon beliefs, Rulin took on a total of three wives in relatively quick, quick succession. The first was Kathleen Jessup, was given, I use the word given in quotes, him by Joseph White Musser on the 14th of February, 1942, a nice Valentine's present, you know, they notice that date. <laughs> uh, this was followed shortly thereafter by a second, LaRue Hunter, whom he met in Idaho, and then a third, Ruth Jessup a cousin to Kathleen. Ruin's polygamous marriages led directly to his arrest during the infamous March 1944 anti-polygamy raid conducted by federal and state officials. Jeffs was one of 30 men, 37 men and women apprehended. Ultimately, 15 of these individuals were convicted of unlawful cohabit cohabitation and sentenced to terms in the Utah State Penitentiary. By April 1945, Jeffs had reached the top ranks of fundamentalist Mormonism, as reflected in his appointment to the elite eight-member priesthood council by then council president John Y. Bartle. To support himself and his growing polygamous family, Jeff secured employment in 1944 with Joseph N. Casella, 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 a certified public accountant firm in Salt Lake City. Some two years later, Jeffs founded his own accounting firm. In 1953, Jeffs branched out and established the Feder Federated Security Insurance Company, a partnership that included a number of fellow fundamentalists. Meanwhile, Jeffs secured lodging for himself and his three wives and children in a large multifamily residence located on Lincoln Street in Sugar House. The house itself was divided into a series of apartments w which were large enough to accommodate not just the Jeffs family, but also the families of a number of <coughs> other fundamentalist Mormons. It also served as a semi-official center for fundamentalist activities, including the publication of uh, Truth Magazine. During the early 1950s, Ruin Jeffs and his fellow fundamentals faced two major challenges. The first was a major schism within the ranks of fundamentals Mormonism itself, ultimately resulting in the formation of the rival Apostolic United Brethren. Ruin supported the old council, thereby rejecting the leadership claims of Joseph White Musser and Rulin Allred, the latter who, following Musser's death in 1954, assumed leadership of the schismatic polygamous group that came to be known as the Apostolic United Brethren, or AUB. Concurrent with the schism came a second major challenge, and that was dealing with the negative fallout resulting from the notorious 1953 raid on Short Creek. Although the men and women captured in that notorious raid were ultimately released, consequences from the raid were felt by fundamentalist Mormons in the Salt Lake Valley. 
Gruen just feared a similar rate against his own large polygamous family. Thus, in 1954, he secretly evacuated four of his polygamous wives, along with their children, to Sacramento, California, where they remained in hiding for two years. Among those sent to the Golden State was Marilyn Steve Jeffs, Ruland's fourth plural wife, who during her time in hiding gave birth to Warren Steed Jeffs on the 3rd of December, 1955. I hate to admit that he was, a, a, I guess, a native Californian. Anyway. <laughs> Ultimately, all four of Jeff's plural wives, along with their children, returned to Salt, the Salt Lake Valley. Initially, Ruland found lodging for his displaced wives and children in apartments and, and houses scattered throughout the valley. The wives assumed fictitious surnames to protect their identities. Meanwhile, Ruland purchased a four-acre parcel of land near Sandy at the mouth of Little Cottonwood Canyon. It initially served as a family farm. Eventually, on this same property, Jeffs oversaw the building of a number of large houses to accommodate his growing polygamous family. The most conspicuous was a three-story white and pale yellow mansion completed in 1968. It contained some 8,300 square feet of living space, boasting 23 bedrooms, two kitchens, 10 baths, and four fireplaces. Downstairs, it contained a tiled baptismal plot of font, and on the main floor, there was a large meeting room designed to accommodate some 300 people. Here, worship services were held for local church members. Over the following decade, Jeffs oversaw the construction of five other houses. These included separate residences for his four oldest sons as they came of age. In, early, in, in the early 1980s, Ruland ordered the construction of yet another house to be built for himself, which was considerably smaller than his original sprawling residence. It was designed to accommodate the fewer family members who were living with him by that time, because his older children, having become adults and moved out on their own. Ruland's original home was then converted into a private school for his, his own younger children and the children of fundamentalist uh, followers. It became known as Alta Academy. In general, the Jeffs family compound, I'm quoting from the Observer, gave the appearance of a feudal estate plucked down in the middle of a modern, upscale American neighborhood. Jeffs obtained the capital, the funds to, for the, all such construction and to support his large, ever-growing polygamous family through an extensive network of business enterprises scattered throughout the Salt Lake Valley. Among the most important was the Utah Tool and Dye Company, which he founded in 1968, and which by the late 20th century generated $4.8 million in annual sales. It eventually merged into a larger company known as Precision Instruments. Jeffs also had interests in Hydropack, a West Jordan-based manufacturing firm. He also continued to uh, operate his Salt Lake-based accounting firm and also served on the boards of directors of four other business enterprises based in the Salt Lake Valley. He also had interests in a company uh, that was away from the valley known as Dynamic American Corporation, a firm which specialized in mining and farm equipment, which had its headquarters in Hilldale. At the same time, Jeffs had exercised dominion as the principal religious leader over some 1,000 fundamentalist Mormons living along the Wasatch Front. From the late 1960s until the late 1990s, Jeffs' large estate served as the group's de facto headquarters and spiritual center. Jeffs commanded respect with his tall, stately appearance. This was reinforced by his authoritarian demeanor. 
wherein he demanded absolute, complete loyalty from family, friends, and co-religionists. On more than one occasion, he stated, I want to tell you the greatest freedom you can enjoy is obedience. I love that quote. Jeff himself affirmed his strong continuing support for the top fundamentalist leader, Leroy S. Johnson, based in, in southern Utah, the latter the actual president and leader of the priesthood council. And affirming this loyalty, Jeff proclaimed, God has imposed on, on the person of Leroy, Leroy S. Johnson the keys of the priesthood here upon earth, and he is the mouthpiece of God. Jeff himself proclaimed mainline Mormonism to be in a state of apostasy, warning his followers that the greatest sin in the eyes of God is the sin of disloyalty. Outlawing, out, outlining dire consequences. Quote, anyone who has received light and knowledge and, uh, and, and turns away from therein becomes a son of perdition. That's why it is the greatest sin and, impart and unpardonable sin. In general, Ruin Jeffs was both strong and sincere in his devotion to fundamentalist Mormonism. One individual close to the family, Ed Firmage, a nephew to his first wife, Zola, characterized Rulin as, quote, a man of great personal integrity, willing to take some blows for the sake of his belief. Rulin Jeffs was rewarded for both his obedience and devotion in securing the top position of prophet president in what became known as the FLDS Church upon the death of Leroy Johnson. The elder Jeffs, in consolidating his power, got rid of the priesthood council completely, which he pejoratively labeled as, quote, a seven-headed monster. In its place, he affirmed one-man rule, further enhancing his power as church leader. This move, in turn, triggered a major schism within the movement in the wake of the expulsion of two senior priesthood council members, ma namely Marion Hammond and Alma Timpson, who formed the rival, the Centennial Park Group, which located their own headquarters some two miles south of Colorado City. Meanwhile, Jeffs continued to lead the FLDS Church until his death in 2002. In conclusion, Rulin Jeffs reflected the changing face of 20th century Mormon, of fundamentalist Mormonism in three ways. First, during his childhood and as a young adult, he occupied a sort of tenuous twilight zone between mainline Mormonism and the fledgling, uh, which rejected plural marriage, and the fledgling fundamentalist movement. Indeed, uh, he, he was able to do this balancing act uh, initially, but as I said, it, it, it ultimately didn't work out. Now secondly, the second uh, thing he was significant for is his role and activities as a committed polygamist and stalwart fundamentalist Mormon, commencing in the early 1940s, this dramatizing the growing strength of fundamentalist Mormonism as it evolved over the following three decades. And finally, Jeffs as prophet president set the FLDS church on a course toward authoritarian control or one man rule increasingly manifest during his 13 year tenure and which has continued unabated under Warren Jeffs, his imprisoned pedophilic son the topic of Craig's presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Proclamations and prophecies from a prison cell. How Warren Jeffs 
continues to control the FLDS. In the Wayward Pines trilogy, now a television series, author Blake Crouch creates the picture of an isolated town where a deep cloud of foreboding seems to hang over the community. The town's people are suspicious of strangers and afraid to talk about the place or themselves. Added to the atmosphere of fear is the fact that there are cameras everywhere. Friends and even family spy on each other, and there are town leaders who punish those who are out of line. And ultimately, it is revealed there is one man, unseen and mostly unknown, who calls the shots and his faithful minions act to keep everyone else in line in this mysterious little town. In many ways, the twin communities of Hilldale, Utah, and Colorado City, Arizona, could be considered the wayward pines of the, of the Arizona Strip. Both towns are controlled by the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, known as the FLDS. And the community as a whole seems to have a dark cloud of foreboding resting over it. The similarities between the fictional town of Wayward Pines and the real-life communities are striking. The inhabitants of both uh, places are suspicious of strangers, afraid to truly express themselves, are surrounded by cameras that track their every move, and are controlled by a man they not only cannot see, but many of whom have never even met. With the very real threat of arrest by federal authorities, Warren Steve Jeffs, prophet and president of the FLDS, went into hiding in 2003. His arrest in 2006 culminated in his being found guilty of two counts of sexual assault and sentenced to life in prison. As CNN wrote uh, just the other day, quote, it's hard to imagine that a convicted child rapist would be allowed to lead a church from prison, but that's exactly what's going on with Warren Jeffs, end quote. Warren Jeffs continues to exert significant control over every aspect of the lives of faithful members of the FLDS Church. This is achieved through a body of loyal underlings, threats of, ex of excommunication and its devastating results, and a nonstop flow of proclamations and prophecies from Jeff's prison cell. This paper will look at examples of and reasons for Warren Jeff's unnatural control over his followers. The simple answer to the question of why people so dutifully obey the words of a man locked in a prison three states away is because they believe him to be the prophet of God. But it is much more complex and involves not only the belief by his followers that Warren Jeffs is the one man on earth who speaks with God, it also involves a rigid socio-religious construct that has evolved over the years within the fundamentalist Mormon sect. We do not have the time to go into all the factors that set up the perfect storm, so to speak, for a leader like Warren Jeffs. Suffice it to say that as the FLDS moved from the rule of a priesthood council, as explained by Newell in his paper, uh, to, um, uh, that was made up by the leading men of the community, to a one-man rule or extra powerful prophet figure without any religious and social controls or safety guards it left itself vulnerable to the machinations and manipulations of a man such as Warren Jeffs. Isaac Weiler, a former member of the FLDS, described Warren Jeffs as a control freak from hell, <laughs> whose demeanor was cold, almost mechanical, but whose sermons delivered in a monotonous cant were strangely hypnotic. Family members, as well as other former church members described Jeffs as a person who not only liked to be in control, but also liked to mess with other people's lives. In order for Jeffs to be able to continue to exert control over his flock, he and his most loyal followers have portrayed him as an innocent man of God, <coughs> excuse me, wrongfully accused and, in, and incarcerated by an evil government persecuting God's chosen prophet. A former member said that 
They had been taught by the church's leaders that Warren Jeffs is in prison suffering for members to adequately prepare for the second coming of Christ. Dr. Miriam Holm, the town's health care provider, echoed that idea. She said, we miss our prophet Warren Jeffs. We know he is innocent and we all yearn for his deliverance to be able to see him again. <coughs> Excuse me. try this again. <clears throat> so if the members were only a little more faithful and obedient, the prison walls would come crumbling down <clears throat> and Jeffs would emerge a free man conveyed by angelic escorts. Children and adults are repeatedly reminded that Warren remains in prison because of their fault if they were just a, a little better a little more faithful, a little more giving, God would hear their pleas and free their prophet. There are even pictures of Warren Jeffs hanging in houses and other buildings with the question of how long must he wait in prison? And uh, just to add a little kick in the pants reminder that the people are not faithful enough for Warren to emerge triumphant from his prison cell. In fact, According to Jeffs, God is angry and disappointed with the FLDS for their lack of faith and obedience which has caused him to remain in prison. He has told them, repeatedly told them, in these proclamations and prophecies that are read week in and week out, that if they don't repent and show more faith and devotion leading to his release, God will raise up a new people in their place. An even more potent form of control are his revelations to both the flock and the world. In a series of revelations and proclamations to the President of the United States and other world leaders, Warren Jeffs, claiming in be, uh, to speak in behalf of Jesus Christ, spoke about the murder of unborn children in Sodom and immoral ways not of uh, the pure way of my coming. Uh, he then proceeded to warn the United States, China, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Nicaragua, the rest of Central America, Bolivia, Ecuador, as well as a host of other countries that doom and gloom would come to them. But he also made sure to mention himself <clears throat> by repeatedly commanding, let my servant go that he may perform his mission to prepare my people for my coming. Cause that the prosecutors, this was when he was on trial, um, now <coughs> cease their attack upon my servant Warren Jeffs. And later, after being sentenced to prison, um, he again commanded in a bizarre statement, let my keyholder of full authority go free, my now prophet mouthpiece and pure sealing authority unto sealing blessings unto eternal life. Uh, Jeff's numerous revelations and proclamations have filled more than one volume which has been printed and published, bound in hard uh, uh, bound books and sent throughout the United States and world at a high cost to the FLDS members. But that is not all. God's, uh, Jeff's God also saved some wrath for the LDS church. And this is a quote here. <coughs> Let also Mormon Church, as world calls such, repent, as I shall cause Mount Olympus to fall on Salt Lake City, to make promised prophecy fulfilled that Salt Lake would be a lake again, Mount Olympus falling across valley in world land pressure explosion. That city is my enemy now. Amen. Uh, now only, now no only fundamentalist church is my own true saving power in priesthood on world. Amen. 
Uh, Jeff Scott needs to learn how to speak English, but um, that was the quote there. But some of the most heart-wrenching and controversial uh, revelations and proclamations were saved for Jeff's own followers, uh, who are repeatedly, as I mentioned, called to repentance for forsaking, quote, my laws and ordinances, end quote, and just not doing enough. Uh, but the general displeasure expressed in the prophecies and proclamations have been peppered with prohibitions that make most outsiders uh, looking in just gasp in astonishment. For sake of discussion, I have uh, divided the examples of control into three categories. The first is community and church control. The second is control of daily life and activities, while the third is control of family, marriage, and sexuality. Church and community control. As the prophet of God, Warren Jeffs is revered, and many members see him as a modern Joseph Smith. Every day his faithful followers pray for his release. In fact, three times a day at the Leroy S. Johnson Meeting House, a prayer circle is held praying for him to be released from prison. Jeffs also has significant control over the FLDS. He receives weekly visits from Isaac and Nephi Jeffs, who either secretly record what he says or take notes. Warren's message to the people and any revelations he claims to have received and written in longhand, and they, uh, the sources have said he always writes it in longhand, uh, then he gives it to them. They are typed up, the notes are, and by either the brothers or trusted individuals and then disseminated to the members. Furthermore, he is allowed to send and receive as much mail as he wants and is allowed a 15-minute daily phone call. He then has his representatives stand up at the pulpit each week and deliver his messages. Lyle Jeffs, Warren's younger brother, is his um, accepted mouthpiece. Lyle follows Warren's directives and is recognized as Warren's representative, but has also been known to take latitude with some of the directives. Less known is the fact that Warren has set it up so there are always witnesses, so that Lyle or other leaders, such as the two brothers mentioned, um, are less inclined to change things as they want. He has at least two men visit him at a time so they can be witness to his words and report back to him if one or the other does not relay the message exactly as he wants. He encourages his brothers and other henchmen to spy on each other. That's how he keeps control among his inner circle of leaders. He basically pits them against uh, um, you know, each other. Furthermore, Lyle Jeffs uh, fears his brother. He has, uh, has said that he didn't dare approach Warren on some things because Warren would become angry, send him away, and take his wives and children from him. Another little known uh, wrinkle uh, to the present FLDS hierarchy is the importance of Isaac Jeffs. While Lyle appears to be the public heir apparent of Warren, another brother may actually be closer to the, high, uh, to the highest position. A good deal younger than both Warren and Lyle, but of the same mother um, as both uh, Warren and Lyle. Isaac, according to a close family uh, member, and I might add a very close family member, um, <clears throat> appears to have a higher church calling than even Lyle. On several occasions when discussing difficult issues, this relative saw Lyle defer to Isaac. This in part is because Isaac has been more faithful and trustworthy uh, to Warren than Lyle. As a sign of Isaac's important position in the FLDS church, Warren assigned between three and four of Ruland Jeff's widows to Isaac as his wives. It has been within this framework that Warren Jeffs has issued numerous revelations and proclamations over the years regarding every aspect of members' lives. Beginning in about 2012, a large complex was built in Hilldale in a very short time. The larger part of the complex was used as the new bishop's storehouse. 
the FLDS church took over an elementary school to the north of the storehouse, and in the last months of 2012, there was feverish activity at, uh, at the storehouse when two, uh, and, and the whole complex, when two very large houses and a smaller one were built to the south of the Bishop's storehouse, and the school was turned into a place for interviews, indoctrination, and rebaptism. Families were required to bring their assets to the lobby of the school and turn them over to church authorities. The families then waited in silence for hours in a large room that continuously played videos of Warren Jeff's uh, preaching and, and around uh, the sides were big pictures of Warren Jeff's looking down on them. <clears throat> um, Let's see, preaching. Each member of the family was then interviewed, and if they were deemed worthy, they agreed to live the United Order and faithfully follow their leaders. They were then taken to a small little changing, uh, to small little changing rooms where they changed into baptismal clothes and were baptized. Two baptismal fonts were built from uh, four classrooms, and the interviews and baptisms were going 24 hours a day because Warren had provided a prophecy that if all members were either recommitted to live a, a psionic life or expelled from the community, and if the houses were completely finished by midnight, the 31st of December, 2012, he would walk out of prison a free man. The men building the houses for Warren Jeff's large family and the special house for, him, uh, for Warren were working around the clock as the new year approached and the rest of the community were frantically interviewing and baptizing. In the interview process, thousands were dropped from the church for lack of faith and unworthiness. The houses were finished, and all the people baptized before the stroke of midnight. But when Warren didn't miraculously come forth from the ruins of the Texas prison, the excuse was that the people did not do a good enough job, and therefore they displeased <laughs> God. Another church building project was just this past July, when a nine foot wall went up around the large Leroy S. Johnson meeting house, which according to some critics, broke city code for uh, fence height. The entire fence was built within the space of a little over a week by a small army of men and boys. It left outsiders wondering why so much time, effort, and material was spent on this project. In spite of wondering, there was little question, though, that a project of this size must have come from Warren, or the orders to, to construct that had come from Warren. A former FLDS member said the building of the wall was probably uh, for more privacy from the press and prying eyes. Less than two weeks after the fence was finished, an important meeting took place in the Johnson Meeting House in which dozens of people, including whole families, were exiled from the community. Uh, the, the meeting was devastating for everyone in attendance. For years, the FLDS Church, through its United Effort Plan, owned all of the houses and other property in the town. Those disagreeing with or being cast out by the leaders stood the very real risk of losing their home and property because it was technically part of the United Order, um, or UEP. The UEP tried to evict Ross Chatwin um, as a tenant at will from his home in 2004, but he fought it by going to court and eventually winning. Jethro Barlow was evicted from his home, and it took several years for him to get, uh, to get it back. Finally, because of all of these problems, the Arizona and Utah state governments stepped in and uh, created a UEP trust that controls the properties and runs the multi-million dollar business. In the last year and a half, a number of FLDS families have been evicted uh, by UEP trust authorities from their homes for a refusal to become current on their property taxes or pay a $100 a month occupancy fee. And, um, and, and at first they were paying the fee but then they were told by the uh, leaders to stop paying. So instead of encouraging FLDS members to cooperate with the UEP, uh, the FLDS church and city leaders are going to great expense to create a communal camp on a six acre parcel of land that includes large tents and trailer homes for the evictings to live in. 
Um, and uh, they, all they were doing, uh, the UEP Trust, was asking them to pay their taxes or occupancy fee. But the FLDS leaders even went to the, uh, to the length of telling the members not to read any notices posted on their doors um, and they have, they have people go around and get the notices so that they won't read them. And as um, um, one person said, uh, if they get caught reading the notices, they'll get kicked out of their church. One of my Short Creek sources told me that for the last several months, FLDS leaders have been telling the faithful they need to give even more money uh, than usual in order to pay for new housing outside of town for the people who have been evicted from their homes. Now, perhaps one of the reasons uh, why church and city officials have forbidden their members uh, to read any notices or to pay the fees is because evictions play into the control game. Warren Jeffs had a revelation prophesying that the government would come and drive the members from their homes. Lyle Jeffs and other leaders have uh, reminded the members of this and told them that this fulfills Warren's prophecy. Warren, Lyle, Isaac, and the other Jeffs are good at using difficulties and tragedies to further their aims or tighten their control. A very sad example um, of this is the recent devastating flash flood that claimed 13 lives, all women and children. In the days after the tragedy, Thomas Jeffs, son of Lyle Jeffs, said, quote, the people are going to be scared out of their minds, end quote. And he feared that his father would take advantage of that by telling them that this is judgment from the Lord. He also said that the disaster, quote, played right into his father's and uncle's playbook, end quote, and would prove him a prophet in the people's eyes. Sure enough, a day later, the influence of Warren Jeffs and his brothers could be seen in the news conference held in which the two men who lost uh, wives and children went beyond discussing their loss. Both men read a statement referring to Short Creek homes being taken by the state and called it religious genocide. Joseph Jessup, who lost two wives and children, mentioned losing his home. Ironically, according to uh, records, UEP trust records, neither man has been evicted. What is even more ironic and certainly sad is that Joseph Jessup had already lost his house and family. Warren Jeffs had sent him away to repent from afar, and he had been in Colorado for over four years. When he got the phone call that he needed to come home and identify the bodies of his wives and children. But Jeffs' control of the community does not stop there. It has been commonly known among the Twin Towns populace that the local governments and police force are under the control of the prophet. A relative of Jeff's recently confirmed that the mayor, city council, police, and others are still under the control of Warren Jeffs. Evidence of this was brought forward in June of this year by Charlene Jeffs, estranged wife of Lyle Jeffs, when she testified that the marshals in the town take direction direction from church leaders and help keep children of parents who have been exiled from their parents. At a child custody hearing, a uniform-clad marshal named Curtis Cook arrived at the hearing and told Charlene Jeffs he was attending for and at the direction of the FLDS church. That is not all. According to Sam Brower, the town's uh, marshals, as members of the United Order, attend United Order meetings and have, facil have facilitated the separation of non-United Order families from United Order families. Furthermore, they give regular reports to Lyle Jeffs and have reported to, to the Jeffs when and why outside law officials are in town. Like the Marshals, Colorado City Mayor Joseph Allred also reports to Lyle Jeffs on a regular basis. Okay, control of daily life and activities. At the same time, as the previously discussed turning over of assets and recommitting to live the United Order, Jeffs ordered that trampolines, bicycles, boats, toys, and other possessions be turned in. Furthermore, he ordered that TV watching be greatly curtailed and that there should be no internet access. 
And even before Jeff's arrest and conviction, he had commanded his followers to get rid of all of materials for studying and teaching and use only priesthood approved materials. Control over the daily life of the faithful does not end there, but extends to the food they are allowed to eat. In 2013, word spread that FLDS children were only being allowed a diet of beans and water. While the diet appears to be more than just beans and water, there are still, as Sam Brower, des Sam Brower described it, bizarre menus. No pork, very little meat of any kind, next to no dairy products, Another source from Short Creek explained that faithful members are allowed to only get their food at the bishop's storehouse, and that the amount and variety of food is scant. While there is a good amount of uh, fresh produce now, uh, by late winter, that has usually dwindled to almost nothing. The food of uh, necessity is rationed, and the quality is not good. As a part of rationing, most people are given one meal a day, two for those who, uh, who are doing hard manual labor, and the allowed amount of food is actually weighed per person. A bizarre event reminiscent of a third world dictatorship was recounted by Sam Brower back in 2013. Quote, while Jeffs had decided to celebrate his birthday by having the community pay homage to him by summoning the entire town to the bishop's storehouse and having them all wait in line in order to receive an apple and a couple marshmallows in honor of the day. Their supreme leader referred to the event as a smile from Lyle, end quote. Okay, control of family, marriage, and sexuality. Of all of the destructive decisions made by Warren Jeffs, <clears throat> excuse me, perhaps the most destructive has been the dissolution of so many marriages and repeated breakups of families. Hundreds upon hundreds of families have been broken up, parceled out, renamed as wives and children are passed from an unworthy man to a worthy man, who in turn is accused of being unworthy, and then they are passed yet to another man. Um, and um, thus thousands of people have been negatively affected in this vicious cycle that have destroyed families and left children confused about who they even are. Um, I remember a couple of years back, Will Bringhurst and I were sitting in the Merry Wives Cafe, which is off limits to the faithful, I might add, <clears throat> meeting with one of our contacts. We were discussing family relationships of some of Warren Jeff's wives uh, for the third volume of The Persistence of Polygamy. I noticed a young man, aged about 17 or 18, listening very intently. Finally, he came over and asked what we were talking about. I said that we were talking about who is related to each other, and he replied, those are some of my families. I, I recognize the names, but I don't know anything about them. I wish I did. I was kicked out a few years ago, and I've been on my own since then. FLDS families have become broken up, and those sent away have suffered incredibly. A recent example of such was Ida Roundy Steve, who was age 55. She had previously had a nervous breakdown and had a history of depression. In about May of this year, she was sent away to repent from afar. She was taken to Pullman, Washington, where one month rent was paid for, and then she was left alone <coughs> with no money and told to fend for herself. Two months later, her body was found in the house. She had been dead for almost two months. The cause of death was a bleeding ulcer and malnutrition. There were no pictures of her children in the house, as she had been told that she had lost her children because of her unworthiness, and therefore they were no longer hers. But in practically every room of the house was a picture of Warren Jeffs. For those who were sent away, often for unexplained weaknesses and sins that have supposedly offended uh, God, there is confusion, loss, and a feeling of complete isolation. For those who refuse to leave the community or who decide on their own to leave the FLDS, they are shunned by the faithful who have been told by the Jeffs to have nothing to do with apostates, even if they are family members. And no one dares even question such harsh directives because to question means lack of faith and also the possibility of being expelled. One family that left the church suffered immensely as they lost their friends and are shunned wherever they go. Even more painful was they lost their family. 
and they are no longer welcome in uh, the, their parents' homes or anyone else. <clears throat> Lauren Holm, who chose to leave the FLDS church after being sent away, went to court to have access to his children, explained that when his children visit, his ex-wife parks down the street and has the children go to the house. That's so that she will not have to speak to him as she is not supposed to have any contact. Home is actually lucky, though, because more often than not, when a person leaves the church um, or is sent away, their spouses and children simply disappear. Uh, they are sent into hiding at various secret locations, and the wives and children are assigned to new families. Talking about the numerous families that have been broken up and wives being reassigned from one man to another, Willie Jessup made an astute, albeit crude, so hopefully I won't offend anyone, uh, comment. He explained that the Bible teaches us to honor our father and mother. Quote, Warren Jeffs came along and said, the hell with your father and I'll screw your mother. End quote. The paradox is now that Warren Jeffs is incarcerated, no faithful FLDS are allowed to have sexual relations with their spouse or spouses. There have not been any marriage sealings performed since Jeffs, who was the only one that performed the marriages, was arrested in 2006. And in 2011, they were all told that their marriages were void and they are not to live as husband and wife. They can live in the same house, but they are, are not to have sexual relationships until Warren comes out of prison and, re and uh, reseals them. If a married couple should have relations, it would be considered adultery and they would be punished. But it wasn't just sexual relations that was banned. According to some sources, any form of intimacy was banned. A former member was told personally by Lyle Jeffs that he was not to kiss, hug, touch, or have relations with his wife. Jeff's draconian edicts have had the expected results. There are, all, there are almost no children under the age of four years old, and as each year slips by, the drought of newborn babies paints an ominous picture for the future of the FLDS. There appear uh, to be a few exceptions to that rule, and the backstory is almost beyond Orwellian. In 2013, we were told there were rumors of a, of a new sex ritual that had been introduced that so disgusted one family that they packed up and left the very next day. We had heard from several people about rumors of 15 men who had been selected to father all the babies among the FLDS, and little by little, this was confirmed. One faithful follower was told by Lyle Jeffs that sexual relations would be considered an ordinance and as such would have an officiator, recorder, and witnesses. This follower was shocked. But after leaving the fold, he was told by an insider that the number had actually decreased to three trusted men or seed bearers of a worthy bloodline who were called to impregnate all willing girls and women ages 12 and up. Neither he nor we however, were able to confirm that small number of men or the ages of the females. Nevertheless, enough sources have discussed this practice that it is obvious something that, that nature is happening. Um, so, conclusion. As a close relative of Warren Jeffs recently said, Warren is absolutely in control of the FLDS. He is very much involved. And the effect of these years of Warren's erratic, narcissistic rule has been devastating for the FLDS. Economically speaking, the once thriving communities are struggling, but not as much as their inhabitants. Describing the poverty of the people, Willie Jessup said, quote, the destitution level is almost unbearable, end quote. Another critic of uh, the Jeffs explained, quote, things are really falling apart in Short Creek for the cities and the church respectively. The Jeffs need to keep the slaves sending in their money so the royalty can continue to live in the manner they've grown accustomed, end quote. Sam Brower has referred to the FLDS leadership as a crime syndicate that specializes in child abuse. And that is an excellent description in several ways. One, obviously this is uh, true in terms of the incredible control Warren Jeff's um, uh, inner circle wields as well as their siphoning FLDS members' money and labor. But, but it also extends into every aspect of members' lives 
including, and perhaps most importantly, the disintegration of so many families and, and has a deleterious effect that is slowly, painfully destroying the FLDS. In order to keep control of the religious flock, Jeffs and other leaders have lied and misdirected, cajoled and condemned. And this because they know that should the faithful members get the whole truth about Warren Jeffs and his ilk, it would be as one former member and uh, Jeffs family member, um, but it, who still believes in fundamentalist Mormonism, not just not in Jeffs, he explained it would be catastrophic, uh, catastrophic toll on the people to learn the truth. Over the years, thousands of FLDS have been sent away or have chosen to disassociate themselves with the FLDS church, and many more are in the process of leaving. July 4th this year, Colorado City's Cottonwood Park was a beehive of activity, as at least 3,000 former FLDS members and supporters gathered for a good old-fashioned Short Creek 4th of July as they used to have before Warren Jeffs took control. Carl Broadman said, quote, I think everybody is so hungry for it and thirsty for that old time way, end quote. The exiles had returned to their home to celebrate the way they once had and to demonstrate that in spite of all of Warren Jeffs' efforts to crush and reshape in his warped image, not everyone is going to give in. Jeffs continues to have immense control and power over some, but not all. Thank you. That was very interesting. Thank you. Um, we have about, about 15 minutes for question and answer, and I will just let Newell and Craig field those if you don't want to. <clears throat> okay, you, you want to? Yeah, you, can, you guys go ahead. This is amazing. I, I, your presentation has been just really incredibly enlightening. I have about 50 questions, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> One of the questions I have is how did you ever get that kind of information? And how do you get into that kind of thing? The second question I'm thinking of is my, my sister moved into the Murray District. And there for a while they were talking about the fundamentalist Mormons wanting to go to the temple to get the ordinances. Is this from the same group that was doing that? Or uh, and they were interviewing with the notion that, in fact, our temple recommend things that you have any sympathy with. Uh, how does that fall in place? And, and where are we at? Um, OK, the, the second question first. Um, the. Uh, um, both the AUB and the FLDS have the temple ceremony. So they, they don't need to sneak into the temples. Um, and um, the, uh, admittedly, the FLDS version, uh, thanks to Warren Jeffs, is, um, as I put it, <laughs> when, um, it, I've, I've also spent a lot of time uh, studying anti-Mormon literature. Um, that was my thesis, was, um, 19th century anti-Mormon literature. And when all of this started coming out about what uh, Jeffs did in the temp uh, Texas temple, I said, it's, my gosh, it's as if he read every anti-Mormon tract and decided to fulfill all of the accusations <laughs> that, uh, that have been made. Um, so, so while there are going to be differences, they, they technically, they, they have the basics of, of uh, the, the temple ceremony. In the first question, uh, both Newell and I um, have spent uh, geez, uh, uh, six, seven years um, going to uh, going down to Colorado City and Hilldale uh, to the point where, um, as I said at our book signing for the third volume uh, Wednesday night, I said the the young women who uh, work in the Mary Wives Cafe recognize us now. They now look at us and smile like, "Oh, they're back." Um, but um, we we have been very lucky to be able to talk with a number of people who have left the community, and um, a handful of them are um, are very closely related to the Jeffs. Um, one was uh, yeah, family members. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 David. Yeah, uh, he's now deceased. Yeah, uh, 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 older son named David. He 
he was particularly enlightened. I was able to interview him on uh, three different occasions, and he provided many of the illuminating insights about uh, the family dynamics that a lot of material that I was able to use in, you know, in, in, in fleshing out the life and activities of, uh, of Rule and Jeffs, but also uh, in, in looking at how, you know, because the thing with Warren Jeffs, he, he was uh, a younger son of the fourth wife, but yet uh, he was able to rise to the top. I, 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 this was a, it, it, in our original essay that's in the volume, I, I discuss how Warren Jeffs was able to ingratiate himself to his father to the point where he became his uh, father's favorite. And that's a fascinating story uh, in and of itself. And it's still fully detailed <laughs> in the book. And I got a lot of that information uh, from uh, various siblings, yeah. half-siblings, I guess you'd call them, within the Jeffs family. We were very lucky that we were able to interview we really uh, a, you know, half dozen or so of the Jeffs themselves. Another source that um, I uh, have not identified by name in either the book or in my paper, um, I, I just call him uh, um, uncle of uh, Warren Jeffs <laughs> because um, he still has uh, family members uh, in Colorado City. Is kind of a walking encyclopedia, oh, yeah. um, and so uh, he, he just rattles off the information, um, and so it's it's been very helpful. Whomever, I guess the lady here. Um, been I was really surprised to hear that even their food is controlled. Is that why the women wear dresses? Like, is that why they do they have clothing? Well, oh yes, the the women uh, there's there is strict control. Uh, social control and religious control on what uh, what the women and the and the men wear. Uh, there's actually an essay in the in the volume that talks about um, the the clothing styles of, of the fundamentalists and how they have changed, uh, and not changed in some ways, but in other ways, drastically changed. And the the uh, um, pastel dresses with the with the way that they're designed um, is is really a Jeff's thing. That is not, they, they wore completely different clothing during uh, Uncle Roy, you know, the time of uh, Leroy Johnson. Yes. The, the Cody Brown uh, incidents and the, and the legal proceedings that he's going on and, and with the uh, new Supreme Court thing allowing uh, non-traditional marriages, right. do you think that there'll be another wave of fundamentalism that will follow on Cody Brown and have members of the church embrace it once again legally? Well, I, I, I think you're always going to have fundamentalist Mormonism. It's not going to die. It's always going to be there. Uh, maybe partly facilitated by what you mentioned that we're, you know, as a society, we're more uh, uh, willing to accept, tolerate, whatever you want to say, alternate family uh, uh, styles. And so that's going to help to uh, uh, facilitate that. And there's always going to be, I think, a continuing stream of people from the mainline LDS church because, you know, fundamentalist teachings are based a lot on what uh, 19th century uh, mainline LDS leaders uh, uh, were writing. Journal discourses is very popular in the homes of, of, of fundamentalist Mormons. And they, they, they know LDS history very well. We're, we, we, uh, especially the members of the Apostolic United Brethren, whom we've gotten close to a number of, of, of members of that particular, uh, close personal friends. In fact, uh, uh, two of the essays in there are, are written, yeah. one, one, uh, three essays are one, one by a former member of the AUB and two by a current member of the a AUB. And, uh, you know, so, so they, the, a, a large portion of, of, of the people I know in, in the AUB have come out of the mainline LDS church. There's always been that that continual stream, and I think that's going to continue in the near future. Yeah, just a quick question. How many uh, members would you estimate are under Jeff's control right now? <laughs> you know, that's a really good question. At one time, they estimated over 10,000 members for the FLDS. But um, uh, I, I think Bill would agree with me it's here. Gone down. It, it has gone down significantly because they've kicked out so many people. Some people have just left on their own. 
Um, I would, I personally would put it around, um, this is just my opinion, I would say probably around 5,000 yeah, or less. Yeah, maybe. yeah. It, it, it's just, there's been a hemorrhaging. I mean, there's actually been a schism, and we actually met with the, one of the schismatic, uh, William E. Uh, Jessup, and that was a surreal experience. Let me give you my personal reflection on that. And we met with him and two of his counselors. He's the leader of a schismatic group, very open, but you know they they're very conservative in their dress. They still dress in the in, in, in the style of dresses and stuff. But in the FLDS, if you saw him on the street, you probably wouldn't know him from the FLDS. But we went in, and and, uh, and uh, Craig and I, you know, had an audience with their leader and one of his counselors, and he says. And he looked at me and he says, uh, uh, I, I told him my name, I said, Newell Bringers, he looks at me and says, there's somebody I want you to meet after we get through this uh, discussion. And so we, you know, we, 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 he was very open and we had this very nice conversation and he brings out this woman and her last name is Bringhurst. And you know, Bringhurst is not a real common name, I'm related to all, all the Bringhurst, all of us are related to all the I, I was I was speechless. I says <laughs> I didn't know what kind of say. I I, I I went over to Sugar Hand. I says it's always good to meet one of the family. <laughs> I, was, I, I mean, it's a surreal experience. But I mean, it, 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 we've had all kinds of interesting, uh, rich experiences of that type. I'm sure Craig would agree with me. And I, I, I when we traveled up to Pinesdale. I interviewed the AUB community up there. I met, I met a former classmate of mine that had graduated the same year I had from Jordan High School, which happens to be the same high school that Warren Jeffs graduated. I taught from. Warren at Jordan. Oh, uh, <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> 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 okay, we have um, back to the lady. Yes. Yeah. So, so my husband's on Task Force One, and he went down and helped search for flood victims. And the night before they came home, there was a big meeting with all the searchers. And he said that the fire chief, who's FLDS, gave a very heartfelt, long speech thanking them and basically told them, in short, that they were astounded that anybody came to help them. And he feels like, and the, the women came every night and fed them and lunch and everything. And so he had a lot of interaction. He came home very culture shocked, I have to tell you. But he had a lot of interaction with the community, and he feels like there's hope that this event is really going to open up some of their eyes and realize that they're not as isolated and hated and rejected. I think yeah. Warren makes them feel like that. Exactly. You know, um, and he's hoping that this is going to make them realize that people care about them. And I think what so. What do you think about that? I, I think so. I, um, I heard from a couple of uh, my contacts that, um, you know, I mean, if both Mill and I had heard. Uh, from the various people we talked with over and over that um, they're told by their leaders that they're hated by everyone, uh, I mean, you name it. It goes on and on and on, and that, you know, basically all of the outside world wants them dead. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what it is. And so um, I heard to, from these couple of sources that, yeah, they were just shocked. And, and we're, we're really touched by the fact that people went down there and were looking and uh, you know for for the bodies were trying to help any way they could that all of these messages of, uh, of condolences and everything came in and uh, yeah I think you know sadly <laughs> enough well happily enough something good might come from this horrible tragedy yeah. uh, two questions I haven't been in the right place at the right time. I haven't had a chance to see prophets pray, but I just wondered if, if based on your research, if you guys have seen it, if it's accurate. But my, my bigger question is on the legality of this whole thing. In, in an environment where the LDS church, the mainstream LDS church, is really worried about religious freedom and the restriction of religious freedom worldwide and what it does to the church, you think, gee, let these people do their own thing. You know, but but then I think about what's his face Green, who got busted for Medicaid. Uh, I think he got busted for Medicaid fraud, and that's why I went. It was either Medicaid anyway. It was some government thing. It wasn't you know polygamy. It wasn't Mary taking child brides. And so I'm thinking, okay, the government ought to have an interest in but in getting Warren in shutting Warren Jeffs up, so that because. The results that we see, the social result that we see from all of this is these kids who get out, 
and end up becoming alcoholics and drug abusers in St. George. Because, it, so it becomes a social problem that the rest of us are going to pay taxes to support. So you say, okay, religion, uh, you're a religious freedom versus we're all going to inherit the social consequences of this mess that's being created. Where's the line? What do you do? Well, I, I, I think part of the problem here is, uh, you know, with Warren Jeffs himself, say, why not just isolate him completely? But you have the matter of, of, of constitutional prisoner rights. And so, yeah. you know, that, that's the real issue with uh, Warren, Warren Jeffs. And, uh, the, you know, as, as far as the community is concerned, they, as, 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 uh, as Craig articulately pointed out in his presentation, they, there's deliberate isolation. It's sort of what, what you had in the old Soviet Union. Under, under, you know, during particularly during the period of, of Joseph Stalin, where you're you're isolating this whole community, and and, and they de develop this cult-like uh, mentality, and and it does, you know, and it does, as you indicated, uh, butt up against the idea of religious freedom, and how far do you go in 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 uh, in, in trying to get at these people, and and and, and I think it it it, it, it just you just keep on hoping that he, you know, that that they're going to overreach themselves, and eventually there'll be a, a, a mass exodus. I mean, you see, just the fact that it's dropped from ten thousand to five thousand is an indication that there's significant erosion, and I think eventually, you know, you're you're going to have a, you know, whatever's left is going to be very, very tiny. Yeah. Two things really quickly. Uh, one, actually, Green was convicted for sex with an underage girl. Um, they started looking at him for, you know, welfare fraud to start out with, but um, but they they ended up convicting him uh, because one of his wives was 14. Um, then the, the other thing is, yes, I've seen the movie. Um, uh, Newell and I have interviewed Sam a couple of times, and I have a couple of other times beyond that, uh, Sam Brower. And um, um, generally, I, I really like the movie. And I know that Sam is pushing uh, to maybe shut Warren up under RICO laws, and um, under the RICO law, and um, you know, hopefully, hopefully that works because um, it's bad. <laughs> um, I was going to mention. Remember, the premiere in Salt Lake is tonight. Yeah, yeah that's why it's coming out. So if any of you don't have plans, yeah, yeah or, or if you want to know more, <laughs> yeah, let's go see the movie. Yes, Jeff's uh, coming back. Prophets pray. Prophets pray. Yeah, I'm sorry. The the Jeff's compound at the mouth of Little Cottonwood Canyon is it still? It's gone. Just, they they just gone. recently yeah. tore it down. I I had the opportunity to go out there when when the uh, big the, the the large main house where they have the where they had Alpha Academy was still there and and there was a, another house on the property two houses but I I, I understand that the, and this was I think about a year ago. But I, since that time, they, they, they've torn down all those structures. It had been, they a, it had been an alcohol and drug treatment center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's they? The city did that? I, I oh, think. Who bought it? They, whoever bought yeah, it. Yeah, the uh, private uh, company bought it and, uh, because yeah. they, I mean, it's prime real estate. So what yeah. about yeah. Texas? I'm sorry. What about the Texas? They, the government uh, has taken over that completely because they didn't pay uh, taxes. And so they, they have taken over. In your count, so are you counting the Harmston group and other groups in the? We don't I cover the Harmston group. Yeah, in the we got we had a brief mention in in the chapter that I wrote on race. I mean, he he had some kind of unique uh, ideas on 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 race. That's in the essay that I wrote on race. But we we had uh, we had uh, hoped to have an essay in there on Harmston, and the individual that was going to do that. Uh, uh, backed out because I, I, I mean, I we, we thought he was kind of a fascinating individual in and of himself. And so there's only just that one little mention in there. And then he's mentioned, of course, in the introduction. Yeah, as well as the Kingston's. Like, yeah, but there are, there isn't a specific essay yeah. on the Kingston side. There, uh, the essays focus mostly on on uh, FLDS Centennial Park, AUB, and of course the origins of yeah. all of this. Yeah, great essays on the origins. I had the interview with uh, Armston wow. down there five years ago, and, and his apostles, who we'd run into and befriended, <laughs> yeah. uh, indicated he was the reincarnation 
of Joseph Smith oh. and a further reincarnation of Jesus Christ. So this idea of reincarnation... Yeah, that was a big thing in the Harms. Unique to them, I guess. Yeah, I thought yeah. they'd gone out of business. I went through a I didn't see them. Uh, as far as I'm aware, they pretty much have. Yeah, okay. they, they really dissipated. Yeah. They're starting to yeah. put some more things. Um, we, we really have time for just one more question. One more question. Can I ask Noah a personal question? <laughs> what year did you graduate as a beat digger? Pardon? What, what year did you graduate? Well, I graduated in 1960. I guess that tells my age an awful lot. You're younger than I am. I'm a beat Pardon? digger, too. I graduated in 59 and then came back. And, and then taught there. there. Wow. Oh, wow. So <laughs> you would. I'm welcome back, Connor. <laughs> Female version. That's uh, yeah, yeah, that was, uh, and 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 I was able so to did interview. You live in near where the Alps Academy is, the Brinkhurst lived up on Danish Road. Yeah, that was that was my cousin Ellis and, okay. and his family. They they were they were second cousins, but uh, <laughs> yeah, and there were a number of fundamentals who lived up in that area too. That's uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and that I Danish if Road. One of your famous people would be. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I think the states they had a, they had a home up there. Yeah, and uh, yeah, kind of a compound. Also. Yeah, yeah. And I, I and, and the year I graduated, the oldest of the Jeffs children, uh, uh, she was a sophomore the year that I graduated in 1960. I'm trying well, to remember. Well, there was Alma, but Warren and um, Sarah and Rachel were all the same age. They were all in my honors. And, and and there and there were uh, I, I think a total of maybe uh, uh, t up to twenty of the Jeffs graduated from our high school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right.